So hello and welcome and happy Friday. Today is Friday, July the 15th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 167. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So 79 degrees Fahrenheit outside, that is 26 degrees Celsius, and it's sunny with moderate wind. So the answer to that is the bees are flying everywhere. They're getting on... Uh, Everything they can find right now, clover. We have fields of clover. The pollen resources from sunflowers is not kicked in yet. Cosmos are a long way off. Who knows what else they're getting. Milkweed is kind of in the latter third. Although swamp milkweed will last much longer. So I'm really trying to increase that crop. So if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and you'll see all the topics and related information. At the end of today's video, there is a shout out. So I'm on it. Things are happening. The questions that we're discussing today were submitted over the past week, as always. Some of them as recent as this morning. So I'm trying to do stuff, I'm trying to keep up. And the very first question we're going to get uh, to now is from Ange, A N J. I was at my allotment yesterday morning and experienced a swarm. It was amazing to see, and I was both excited and scared at the same time. Never seen such a thing before. Can they be dangerous? So here's the thing. A lot of people like to make swarm videos. There are swarm videos all over social media. TikTok, Facebook, you name it. And of course, on YouTube. And what a lot of people do, beekeepers like myself, we like to use swarms in their current bivouac location. So in other words, bees depart from the hive when they're reproducing, the existing queen leaves with them. If it's a prime swarm early in spring, this can be up to 70% based on those who actually count the bees. 70% of the population of that hive can go with the queen, which means you can end up with a huge, very dramatic looking collection of bees in a temporary bivouac location. And these are the most sensationalized um, stories when it comes to bees. And that's because it's an opportunity for some beekeepers to, you know, be brave and bold and educate others and stick your hand in there. Who hasn't done that? You stick your hand in there and it feels warm and they're venting and you can scoop out a handful of them. And it's a lot of fun to do. But you have to have knowledge about the bees because we walk right up to an intermediate uh, bivouac of bees, the swarm on their way to a final destination while their scouts are out looking for a, you know, a cavity to occupy. This depends on how long they've been there. So an experienced beekeeper walks up. If they've been there all night, we've had bad weather, the cluster is really tight and they're really trying to survive basically. They're only good for about seven days max and then their resources are depleted and they can't start a new colony and then they're in jeopardy. That's why they like to conserve their resources, including their most important resource, which is what? The bees themselves. So what happens when a bee stings? Bee stings, it dies, they lost that bee. Now that doesn't mean they want to put up with little kids throwing rocks at them or poking them with sticks and things like that. So it's important to be able to read them when you get up close, see what's going on, see how agitated they are, see how potentially defensive they are. What are the current weather conditions and what might that have as far as an impact on the bees response to your being there? So I always ask people when they say uh, they've got a swarm of bees, first I have a little video that I send to them and say, are you sure they're honeybees? Can you please take a picture with your phone and send it to me so that I'll know what they are and kind of what size they are? Because based on the perspective that they take the picture, sometimes they'll say, massive swarm, it's huge, there's so many, and you get there and it's a cluster of bees this big, but somebody got really close to them and took a picture with their camera. But if you've seen a lot of those, you look at the size of the bees in that cluster. And if it's composed of teeny weeny little bees and it's a huge cluster, then it's a big swarm. But often it will be bald faced hornets on a paper nest and things like that. So identifying the fact that they are honeybees is your first step because inexperienced beekeepers might go up there and not even be aware that what they're about to walk into is literally a hornet's nest or a wasp nest, depending on which one it is. 
But uh, so ask a lot of questions to find out what's going on. The next question is how long have they been there? So if they've only been there, they just we, they just showed up, a cloud of them flew through the air and they, they landed an hour ago. That's great. You can go and get those right away. And you can nine times out of 10 guess that they're going to be almost non-defensive. So that means you can go up there with maybe just a veil and uh, you can bag them up. So depending on how they're configured, I catch them in a butterfly net. You can shake them into a box, which if I'm doing that, I spritz them with sugar syrup first to make them nice and wet, a little heavy, so we can shake them in and they all clump in there. And then we can make sure they have the queen with them. And if they're in a difficult configuration, I like to use a BVAC and then I can stand there and at my leisure, just kind of suck them off the branch with the BVAC. The Colorado BVAC specifically is what I use. So there's a lot of ways to get them. So you're, the reason I bring that up is your method of recovering the swarm can have a lot to do with what their response to your presence is going to be. So if you're spritzing them with sugar water, that's kind of a good as a dampener. I don't ever smoke bees that are in their intermediate location on their way to a final destination. They just don't do it because they've never really had to. Uh, there are some videos out there that are pretty funny where beekeepers show up and they go to collect a swarm that seems harmless. Next thing you know, they wore no veil, they wore no protection at all, which other beekeepers like to make fun of. They like to use that as the big put down. Kind of beekeeper wears protection when they go up to a bunch of bees. And it is kind of funny to see that same person later with one eye swollen shut and things like that. Maybe people think that's poetic justice, but no, you killed bees to make your point. So the goal is not to agitate the bees with your methods of extraction. Extraction. This is recovery of a swarm, so it's not an extraction. I have to watch my words here. Uh, if they've been there a long time, they can start to set up house. They can start to build comb on open branches if they couldn't find a cavity. Therefore, now that becomes their final resting place. And once they start to commit to that, guess what else happens? They start to defend it. So that's where knowing how long they've been there plays an important role in how defensive they have the potential to be. The other thing is, where are these bees located? What part of the country are you in? Is there any chance that they could be hot stock to begin with? Because some bees, no matter what they're like, or where they are, or how long they've been there, are going to be hyper defensive, while others are completely passive. And those are the ones that, as I have done in the past, you can walk up and scoop handfuls. And I like to try to teach about it, especially when we have a lot of time. There's not a storm on its way in. We don't have high winds coming. The day isn't ending, so you're not showing up at 7 at night to collect the swarm. So we have lots of daylight and opportunities to show people about the bees because people tend to gather around things like that, especially if it's in a residential area. So we can teach them about how bees decide where they're ultimately going to go. So on the surface of that intermediate uh, destination, that bivouac of bees, you see little dancers on the surface of that, trying to pass off their information. Now, why are they waggle dancing on the surface? Because those are scouts that may have even picked a location before they left the hive that they flew out of. And so what they're doing is they're trying to convince the other bees at that intermediate location that this is the final destination that they want to go to. And here's your chance to mess with their decision making. You find the waggle dancers because those are the influencers. Those are the ones with all the followers. You scoop those up with your hand and you take them over to the boxes you want them to go in and you start putting them in that box. You can prime that box and you close the lid each time you put them in there so they have to go through it and then out of the entrance. And then you go and you get another scoop of them. And you invite people that are watching to come and watch how this goes. And as long as your hands are moving slow and you're just gradually scooping them out and keep your fingers apart, I don't... Because if you go to close your fingers later, you can smush a bee and get some stings on your hands, which some beekeepers don't mind. My goal is always not to be stung. I know. So then I just scoop them out and then I put them on the landing board then. And then I see them run off my hand and into the entrance. Ooh, we're gaining ground. And then you scoop some more and put your hand on the landing board and watch the entrance. Now this is when we don't care if we catch them or not. It's an opportunity to play with bees. And I've been playing with swarms for a long time. So once you start to do that, then you can see, here's the fun part, the bees that are going into the box that you've brought with you that hopefully has some resources in it that also attracts the bees. 
uh, when they go into the box, and you see some of them coming back out of the box, and you can see this exchange. They fly to that bivouac location, and then you'll see them do their little waggle dance. And if you have knowledge of what the waggle dance decoding is like, you'll know that they're making that information referencing the sun's current location. And so when they start to waggle, and you know where the sun is, and you know the angles that they're dancing, and you also know the duration of the waggle and the number of waggle cycles they make, based on how excited they are about the location, but a very limited waggle, almost what's called a circle dance, where they don't even have time to waggle. They do a circle, they go this way. They turn counterclockwise, they go the same direction. They turn clockwise, they go the same direction. And if that direction is where your box is, you're winning the election. And then when they all leave and take into the air and they all go into that box, because that's what's going to happen every single time. Okay, maybe not every single time. But it has every time I've demonstrated it, which has made me look like an above average beekeeper because they left that on their own then. I didn't have to bag them. I didn't have to shake them off the branch. I didn't have to clip the branch. I didn't have to vacuum them. All I had to do was win the election and get all of those bees to go into that box that I want them to go in by collecting their influencers and convincing them to think the way I think about the box they're about to go into. And if that box is no good, by the way, if it's too small or too large, they may not go. But they all took to the air and they all flew into that box. It was like turning on a faucet of bees and it's a lot of fun. So, long story short, reading the register, re reading the register, reading the bees behavior is going to keep everyone safe around the bees, not agitating them unnecessarily, gathering information like an on-scene investigator. You show up. What did you see? When did you see it? Has anyone tried to collect them? Have kids been bothering them? Have they stung anyone already? Because all of these things play on what you're about to deal with. Now, if you want to suit up in your full bee suit, that's good too, because now you won't have to run away when things possibly get out of hand. Even some of the most accomplished swarm collectors on YouTube have found themselves in a hot spot every once in a while. So you can always start with a full jacket and veil on and everything and walk up and see what's going on. And then when you realize their disposition, if it's very calm, start to relax your levels of protection and then migrate the bees into whatever box or container that you need to do to transport them. My favorite container for transporting uh, rather than bring the actual hive with me, if I know for sure I'm going to shake them off and put them into a, a container of some kind to transport them, my current favorite container is the Hive Butler with a screened plastic lid on it. Hive Butlers are expensive. They're plastic. But I don't think they're ever going to wear out. So it's a, a case of a piece of equipment that's very useful, even within your own bee yard, and I'm just going to plug them for kicks right now because I like it because I can put frames in it. And when you put your frames in your hive butler, they're spaced apart wide enough. And so when you dump bees into them, when you're collecting a swarm, instead of bringing your hive box, a single deep 10 frame or 8 frame, whichever you want to bring, you'd have to strap that shut or put screw brackets on the side of it to make sure it doesn't shift or come apart in transit. Where if you have just a hive butler there with the frames that you're ultimately going to use in your final box... That are hanging in the hive butler when you shake your bees in there they migrate to those because that's where they get good footing also it probably smells good if it's already drawn out comb and things like that and you've got bits of propolis and beeswax in there to make them feel at home once you dump them all in there then you just transport that whole thing put the screen top on put it in the back of your car and off you go now that works because you don't have to wait to see if the queen is with them if they're clustered around the queen Here's what I do with the hive butler. I clip the whole branch just beyond the cluster, put the whole branch and everything inside the hive butler, and it's, it's big enough to hold 10 deep frames with extra space underneath. So a hive butler is big, bigger than a 10 frame deep box. And so if you just put three or four frames into one side, you can clip the branch, put the whole branch in, put the lid on, you've got all the bees. There wasn't any shaking. There was So these are judgment calls on how you're gonna collect and transport your bees. But if it's an intermediate swarm like this, and they're all on one tree branch, and you get permission from that homeowner to clip the branch, put the whole thing in there, and off you go, you're done. And then when you get to your final destination, then you're going to install them in the final hive. 
Hive Butler, great way to transfer that stuff. But so when it comes to can they be dangerous, can they sting you? Sure, bees can sting at any time. But it all boils down to all of these other contributing factors when you're dealing with a swarm that's in its intermediate bivouac location. Some people have asked too before, if they're clustered somewhere and there's a swarm gathered, is it guaranteed that there's a queen with them? Well, 99.99%, yes, because it's the queen's pheromone that keeps that swarm together. If there were no queen present, then there'd be no cluster. They would return. And somebody else asked that question later on today, and we're going to talk about that too. So that is question number one. Question number two, moving on, comes from Ronald. What do you feed your bees during a dearth, and how would you feed, if any? Okay, well, I say it over and over again uh, that I don't feed my bees unless it's a brand new, like you just collected a swarm. You would put sugar syrup or something on there to help them along. Uh, I have even in a lot of cases, especially this past year, this past spring, I have not put feed on even the swarms that I collected. But the key here is during a dearth. A dearth means the environment is not providing nectar or pollen Maybe there's no rain. Maybe it's the time of year when your bees are generally in decline anyway. Um, and this is kind of a difference between maybe backyard beekeeping and commercial beekeeping, where if I depended on my bees for income and I needed to keep their numbers up because in the fall, maybe I derive a lot of my income from honey. Honey sales. So if I had to do that, I need numbers. I need the numbers of the bees to do that foraging, to get the nectar in, to store the honey for me so that I can market it later. And I need bigger colonies. But in the backyard beekeeping practice, depending on your motivation for keeping the bees, you may not have to feed during a dearth. Won't they use all their stored resources then? Yes, they will. And you're going to find out which of the bees that you're keeping are acclimated to where you live, that they should be reducing the number of brew they produce in response to what resources are coming through the landing board from the foraging bees. Now, when the forage starts to get light, when the nectar's not coming in, the pollen's not coming in, and the bees inside the hive, the nurse bees in particular, when they realize that the resources are not coming in to provision the brood that is hatching now, then they will force the queen to cut back on her egg laying, and in some cases, even during a period of dearth, when they know they don't have resources to feed the brood they already have, they'll start policing up the eggs and eating them. So you can stop that by, of course, feeding. Some people want to put pollen patties on in the middle of the summer and things like that. Personally, if you're just asking me, I don't do any of that. Uh, but of course, I don't live in the desert southwest. I don't live somewhere where everything dries up and in the middle of summer, you have nothing for the bees. If uh, you look at beescape.org, uh, you'll find out kind of what historically has been available in your area. And if there is to be a dearth, what time of year it would exist. And I don't have those issues because I don't have a dearth. So it happens for me at the end of the year when things are getting cold and the bees are really condensing their clusters going into winter. So right now, I don't. But what would it, let's say I had to. Let's say they're absolutely out of everything. They're at risk of dwindling. Now they are livestock. You do have a responsibility not to just let them die out from starvation. That would be terrible. That happens to people sometimes in winter. But in midsummer, uh, it shouldn't. Then you can, and here's what I like to do, because you know what else is going to happen at that time? Uh, your bees are going to start robbing one another. So when there's a dearth and when there's a lot of foragers out, that's when they start scouting other hives. That's when they start trying to find out who's got lower defenses, lower numbers, fewer guard bees on the landing board, and they'll exploit those resources. Your biggest, strongest colonies can actually raid the colonies that are small, that need the resources the most, that have not stored a bunch of uh, resources up. So to stave that off, you can do open feeding. I've done it in the past, but then I realized I really didn't need to do it in the past because what I end up with is going to the next nectar flow. And there again, my situation might be different from yours, but there's too much honey in there. I have that issue right now. 
I have hives that are too productive, too prolific, they have too much honey on, and they're taking up all available cells for honey storage. That's bad because they need room for the queen. So when we had temperatures down in the high 40s and low 50s in Fahrenheit over the past couple of days, I was happy to see it. Because that means the bees are going to have to use some of their honey for carbohydrates. And they're going to have to keep the brood warm, which there is plenty brood in all the hives right now. So to me, that's a balance that kind of draws back, uses some of the resources, which I want them to, because I know there's a big nectar flow coming up and they don't have room to put it. So we have to expand the colonies eventually. But I don't feed. If I did, in the hives, if there were just one or two hives that were lagging and I wanted to boost those, inside the hive, feed or shim on top on top of the inner uh, cover and then give them sugar syrup carbohydrates only i don't want to stimulate them to, to build a bunch of brood i don't want them to starve to death so the carbohydrates that's what the sugar syrup is going to take care of um, but i don't want to boost a bunch of brood at a time of year when the environment's not producing it does that make sense proteins all right commercial people you got to really kick it in and keep it up because your livelihood depends on those bees. For me, it's an opportunity to see how well they do on their own. And thank goodness for the observation hives because I can see and use them as indicators of what the rest of my hives might be going through. But this year has been a ridiculously productive year. Honey, brood, reproduction in the bees, everything else, they're just expanding. And uh, it's just a great year for beekeeping so far. Question number three, uh, YouTube channel, O oh Canada. I place the hive in the shadow. It says, should I place the hive in the shadow of the tree or expose it to full sun in summer and reverse it in winter? Best, Tad. Okay, so for Tad, you're in Canada. If I were in Canada, I'm in Northwest Pennsylvania, Northeastern United States, snow belt, fairly cold area. If I were even north of here in Canada, this is what I would do. All my hives would be in the sun, full sun all year round. Here's the other part of it. I have hives facing in every direction through the years, through many years, so I can keep records, see how they do, what the behavior is, and uh, what benefit, if any, there might be to a landing board that faces a specific direction. And we've honed that down. And this is reinforced by lots of other researchers and honeybee observers. East by southeast is the best exposure for your landing board or the entrance of your hive. Face it east by southeast. Have it in full sun. And for those that live in the south now, see I'm not a southern guy. I've lived in the south, but I didn't keep bees down there. Uh, they have problems with small hive beetles. So if you're in a warmer climate, then it also holds true. Keep your bees in the sun, out of the shade. Now I understand. If bees were living in the natural cavities that they occupy, they would be in trees. They would be shaded, right? But if we're keeping bees in boxes, which really is not natural at all, <laughs> If we keep them out in full sun, we find that the numbers of small hive beetle infestations are reduced. So small hive beetles, for some reason, have a better go at bees that are stored in shade or uh, positioned in shade with their hive boxes out of the sun. So sun, full exposure, shade, full time, or even half of the day gets more small hive beetles than those that are exposed in the sun. So, and for those of you that are in the South that have tried those experiments, uh, interesting to hear it from you, but that's been reinforced by everybody I've talked to. It's one of the questions that I ask, especially those who are experts in small hive beetles, which I happily have not even seen a single small hive beetle in any inspection up here this year. So I don't know what's going on. Maybe my chickens are doing great. Here's another thing that I noticed, uh, because I still do have hives that have their landing boards facing north, facing west. And it's so that I can make these comparisons all the time. Do you know where they focus their brood? Uh, always down low near the entrance, but they concentrate their brood towards the warm side of the hive. And there's another thing that they do. Uh, inside the hive on the south facing wall, for those that have north facing landing boards and entrances, they're trying to chew the opening between the bottom board and either the slatted rack 
or that first brood box. They're trying to chew openings in the corner, any place where they can get it. So instead of sealing things up, which they generally do with propolis, they're actually trying to make openings on the warm side. So what are they telling me? Where do they want their entrance to be? On the east or southeast side of the hive. So those hives need to be flipped, but I'm not going to do it because I don't just do it as a one-off or I see it through one year. I've observed this behavior through 14 years of bees. Where are they facing? What are the benefits? What are they doing? Especially when it starts to get colder. They, they shift over and they consume the resources on the warmer side, the eastern side, the southern side, in winter especially. So it's pretty interesting stuff. But uh, full sun, especially in Canada, as I said. East by southeast landing board exposure. Melt sun off in winter quicker too. And they fly out, they do cleansing flights and everything else. And people can get upset that I help the bees and scoop out those openings with my entrance scraper. But... Uh, my bees made it. They did great. So I have no problems with uh, seeing the snow melt off and stuff like that and helping them out. Question number four. Lucille, Clovis, California. I have new packages of bees, Saskatrass bees. When is a good time to place my Flow Hive Honey Super on? Two, my hives are filling the cones. Well, let's answer number one first then. The best time to put it on is when the bottom, my configuration always with low hives because I don't use queen excluders. If you're brand new to beekeeping, you better start off with queen excluders until you figure out where the brood stops, where the honey bridge begins. So for me, deep box, I have a video coming up. I've winter designed a flow hive that I'm gonna talk about and I'm gonna show you step by step. All the equipment comes from flow. So anyway, deep brood box. Once that's full, eight out of 10 of the frames. If it's an eight frame, six out of eight of the frames. Once those are full and productive, it's time to put your medium super on. Flow Hive doesn't make a medium super. So you have to put a regular Langstroth medium super on it and it's gonna overhang by a quarter of an inch because they don't match up. And then once they fill those up and you can see the crest, you know, the crown of where the brood ends and where nothing but honey begins. Then the next box, once that's done, 80% of those frames are full of honey and resources and they're just finishing it up, that's when you put your flow super on. And then uh, they'll start to work it. And then that'll make it easy when the nectar flow hits and once it's all worked up and they've sealed it with wax and started to draw out those leading edges and everything, they'll start to store nectar in there and you can watch it through the side panel and through the back. Mine right now are filling the flow frames right now in July. Next question, she says, uh, my bees are filling the combs with sugar syrup. Is there, and there is no place for the queen to lay. What are my options to avoid a swarm? Well, first of all, don't feed sugar syrup. That should not be on. Once there's a bloom and once there are resources in the environment, don't feed. <laughs> let, them, let them do things at their own pace. But if they're filling everything, you have to provide another box. You have to keep expanding the hive. Now I know when it comes to flow hives, they come this way. A deep box, queen excluder, the flow super, nothing else. If you go to their website, you can get an extra brood box and then you can do a double, but guess what? The brood box is a full depth box. You're gonna be lifting 70 pounds. They don't even have handles on them really. So, you need a medium box, so you just get standard Langstroth equipment. It's going to look ugly, it's going to mismatch, but you're going to provide that extra resource for them. So sometimes I have a single deep brood box and up to two medium supers before the flow hive if they're being really productive. Because the flow super is going to come off in winter and those bottom boxes are going to stay on for winter and that's the resources for your bees to get through without feeding. So in reference to the other question too, if it's the winter dearth, if we're talking winter time, what I am going to do henceforth is I'm going to put Hive Alive winter fondant patties on there. And I used to put uh, sugar with rapid round. So if you don't want to do fondant, you don't want to spend the money or whatever, you just want sugar, the rapid round feeders sit on that inner cover 
and then I put dry sugar for winter time. See, so I don't do any summer feeding anymore because the bees are doing so well on their own. I think we need to match our bees with the climate set we live in. So that's it. But sugar syrup, no, no, don't. Not this, especially when you're trying to put the flow supers on. We don't want them moving any sugar syrup around. We want it all to come from plants. Backyard beekeepers, we don't have those pressures. We don't have to fill 55 gallon drums. We just have to fill the little honey jars that we give to our friends and stuff. Question number five, Gerard Johnson. Is it known or speculation that there is a difference in worker eggs, drone eggs, and bee eggs? Or is it that the cell build-out tells the nurse bees how to feed and make the larvae grow in different ways? It's very hard to believe the queen could determine this egg will be a boy, and this egg will be a girl, and this egg will ascend to the throne and become my successor with three question marks. So this is honeybee biology. And I'm actually glad that question was asked because I think a lot of people may not understand what's in the beehive, how that biology works, and what those eggs mean. An egg is an egg is an egg, right? No, it isn't. There are three casts in a beehive. And we're talking about Apis mellifera, we're talking about honeybees. The only one that should be laying eggs, and I'll get on to that, others can, the queen that is in there. Generally, there's just one queen. Sometimes there's more than one queen, but only the queen can mate with a drone and can lay fertile eggs. And I'm gonna talk about that. The workers, so these are the casts, the queen, the workers, and the drone. The workers are female, they have a lot of the same reproductive anatomy that the queen has, but it's tiny. They have ovaries. They're tiny too, but they cannot mate with a drone. Therefore, the worker bee, the female, cannot mate with a drone and therefore has no place to store sperm. And therefore, when they produce eggs, they cannot produce eggs that are fertile. That's why when they lay their egg, it becomes a drone because there's haploid and diploid. Haploid are the infertile or eggs that were produced without sperm. So they're not female, they're only going to be male. Now the drones themselves, they're the ones that produce, you know, reproductive queens by mating with them and providing them with the sperm that they carry. So here's the thing, the queen, she has been out and she has mated. We all know the story. She goes to the drone congregation area. She gets worked up in the party environment and she mates with a whole bunch of drones and back she comes fully mated. So she's got the sperm stored in her body in a sac that's called the spermatheca. And the sperm for all the years that that queen is going to live and reproduce, millions of sperm are in the spermatheca. She also has the ability to produce eggs now. When the egg travels through her reproductive system, it passes a little duct that the sperm goes through. And guess who controls that? The queen does. So when she's looking into a cell and it's too big for a worker, she knows, huh, it's time to park an infertile egg in this cell, a haploid egg. And so when it goes down and it gets to that point where she can reduce sperm that would impregnate the egg and cause a female to be developed. She withholds that, the egg travels through without being fertilized, deposits into that cell, and that develops into a drone. So it's the queen that controls that. And then when she's in smaller cells, and those are worker size cells, as the egg's coming through, sperm gets released. Several of them come out for every egg that's going by, and that increases the chances of that egg being fertilized. If they're not fertilized properly, if something's wrong with the egg or whatever, the bees will police that up, the nurse bees will eat it. So it's not that the workers decide that this will be a drone or this will be a female worker, it's the queen that decides. Now, the third part of it is, what about when it's a queen? And this is the mind blowing part of honeybee reproduction and cast selection and development. 
any worker egg that's been put in that cell because it has all the chromosomes to be a female, right? It's a male, it has half the chromosomes. It's a female, it's ready to go. They alter the final destination of that bee's development with diet alone. So they build a bigger cell around it because it's going to get bigger and they feed it royal jelly and they boost the royal jelly quantity and frequency of feeding and it just continues to grow and which is amazing because it's going to be a queen then it's going to get a bigger cell it's going to hatch quicker than any other cast in the hive so we get the most critical reproductive center of the hive another queen through diet alone and she is developed and comes out of her cell quicker than a worker which takes 21 days or a drone which takes 24 days and she's the most critical part of that be all through diet it's amazing so yeah the queen does decide uh, who's going to do that but then the workers can decide whether or not to make that a queen or not so very interesting stuff mind-blowing and uh, just the fact that diet alone changes the cast of the bee now a queen that never got mated for example so she has nothing in her spermatheca queen never did a mating flight but she developed in there and she's cruising around you can have what's known as a drone laying queen and that's because she never made it she has no sperm she can't fertilize the eggs but now she's in egg production eggs go down she parks them in the bottom of the cell they look great but even though it's a worker cell it develops into a drone and you identify those by the extreme convex surface of the worker cell that's got a real bulb on the end of it some people call those bullet cells and that's because the queen is laying in worker cells but she's only producing infertile eggs which means drones are going to develop and they need more space so you get this big bulb on the surface of it so you can have an instance where you know you would have a drone laying queen because she doesn't have any sperm to make fertilized of course then female workers in the hive very cool stuff question number six comes from eric Summersworth, New Hampshire. Okay, this is a long one. Let's see what goes on here. I was in Saratoga, New York recently and decided to visit Better Be on the way back to New Hampshire and pick up some woodenware. I also picked up a hive gate for this fall's robbing season. Are you still using the hive gate? And do you have any new info to report on the product? How do you feel about it? Well, if you were at Better Bee, they got all the survey information for all the people that were testing the hive gates. Hive gates are entrances. Uh, and if you don't know about it, they look like this. We had them on half the hives going into winter here. I did learn that I don't want doubles. You have a configuration where you can have a single entrance with these or you can have doubles. Singles did better in winter than the doubles did. And they do help profoundly to give your bees an opportunity to fight off wasps at the end of the year in particular. And those that are in the Northwest, the state of Washington, for example, where a lot of beekeepers lose a lot of their colonies due to wasp attacks at the end of the year, they reported fantastic results with them. So yeah, they work and Better Bees sells them. I wish you would ask them while you were there because they've got all, I haven't seen you know, the final results of the survey that they published yet. They work for me, especially for uh, defending against wasps. Bumblebees can't even get into them. Mice can't get through them. So they eliminate the need for a mouse barrier, things like that. There's a lot of advantages to it. And they still have them on roughly half the hives. So yes, they worked. On another note, I installed a nuke this spring. After uh, a failed first attempt last season, due to the late season bear attack, the nuke started off well, but I decided to stay out and let the girls do their thing. I did an inspection. I found a lot of capped brood, no eggs or larvae, and no queen to be found. I did notice two capped queen cells. A couple of weeks later, all bees hatched and no new brood. It was early in the season, so I decided to let it play out and see if another queen was produced. Trying to use exterior sign, I noticed a decrease in pollen coming in. Increase in the numbers hanging out on the landing board and milling around with spread out wings. 
After another couple of weeks, I looked inside again and still no brood, no eggs, no larva. So it's been two weeks, 14 days. Bees were filling the brood area with nectar and pollen, so I ordered a queen and installed her. And the next day, I noticed no spread wing on the bees hanging out on the front board. A week later, I have lots of capped brood, but no eggs or larvae. I looked. So if we look at that timeline, I'm going to stop right there. If you had at that point lots of capped brood, no eggs or larvae, something sneaky is going on in there. Because we know that when a queen lays an egg, it's an egg for three days. When that egg hatches and is being fed, it is a larvae for six days. And then we know after that, it's covered or capped pupa for 12 days. So if we look at this timeline, somewhere in there during this period, there has been a laying queen. Assuming this capped brood is worker brood, there is a queen in there that is avoiding you. Also, and you said you looked and there's an exclamation point, but if we're following bee biology, they can't have those pupae in there at that stage already with a new queen that you installed, something else is going on. Someone's producing fertile eggs in that hive. So anyway, is this bad luck? Or maybe she is there, but she ran out of room to lay, added another medium. Will they move resources to the empty box and make room for the queen to lay? I have a feeling I'm not the only one with this dilemma. There was a, something else is in there laying besides the queen that you brought in. So there's stuff going on. Uh, if they're definitely, if they are honey bound and there's not enough room for the queen to lay that's going to have a profound impact on even whether or not the nurse bees will allow her to lay so here's the thing there's another product and since you go to better bee too better bee sells a product that's called better comb and better comb can be provided in a pinch because the comb is already drawn out and it's a synthetic beeswax comb so you could just put two or three frames of that in a super directly over the brood area here and what will happen is they'll start to use that right away to store honey and nectar. And that will alleviate some of the cells down below, which the bees can then consume those resources and open up those cells for brood production. Because there is a queen in there somewhere. Based on this description, there has to be. And she has to be productive or you couldn't get to the point where you have capped brood. So something is reproductive in there. They are fertile. And those, if those are worker cells then all you have to do is provide the space for them. So, but if you want to kick it off, because sometimes when they do start to get honey bound, they can uh, start to make plans to get out of there. So the only way to alleviate that, because once they're deciding kind of to take off, if they feel congested and, and you know, they're becoming honey bound, uh, we need to provide them with already drawn comb because they're hesitant to make brand new comb under those circumstances. I don't know why. But this is where I keep better comb on the rack ready to go for something just like this because they will immediately start to use it. They'll get in there, they'll clean the cells, they'll start using them and they don't have to uh, spend the time and we don't have to wait for them to be inspired by pheromone stimulus to go ahead and build new infrastructure. It's there, we're giving it to them. You don't need to provide a whole box of it because it's expensive. Two or three frames we'll get them going and then they'll continue to expand from there and i hope you'll keep us posted on what happens here but uh, anybody that has that circumstance think about the cycles of eggs larvae pupae and when they emerge from their cap cells that will let you know when in the timeline there you've had to have had a queen producing eggs to get you to that stage so work it out and you'll find out that there was a laying queen in there somewhere. So you may actually have a two queen colony now. Uh, very interesting stuff. So I look forward to updates on that. This is question number seven from Tim and Vicki. And this is uh, Fergus, Ontario. Uh, this spring we started our first hive, 10 frame, with a nuke. The bees have filled eight frames in the brood and we added a medium super. That has also been mostly filled, and last week we added the flow super. So another flow hive. 
And uh, the bees are interested in it and moving around, but we've noticed a lot of condensation in the flow super. Flow supers, by the way, are all plastic frames and it's a deep box. So it's just like, it adds a lot of extra space above your bees. So anyway, especially in the morning, later in the day, it's mostly dissipated or the bees have removed it. Just wondering if that's normal for flow supers. Our temperatures have been around 23 to 25 Celsius, which is 75 to 77 Fahrenheit during the day, lower at night. So yeah, and this is something that we see. And this happens in wintertime too, so I'm glad it's being brought up because we need to think down the line uh, regarding how we're going to configure our hives. The hive is too big for the bees to populate it. So the other thing that's not answered in here, but I'm just going to make an assumption that there's no top vent, that there's no upper entrance because cooler air can come in up there as well. But if there's no venting and no upper entrance, you're also helping your bees out when it comes to this kind of configuration. It's perfectly normal to see condensation beneath the cluster of bees where your brood is located. So you see condensation near the entrance that forms in the interior surfaces. And if there's a big empty space above, then you also will see condensation up there and it'll cycle out just like you're describing. As the bees move up there, start to use that area and populate that area, the condensation will stop building and dissipating during the day. And it's important to bring that up because this is why when people think that they're being generous to their bees and they put a whole bunch of boxes on and they leave a lot of honey on and they think, I'm just going to leave all these boxes and all this honey on and then we're going to go until spring and then I'm going to harvest the leftovers. I think it's a good idea in spring to harvest leftover capped honey that you have in your hive because they're just going to leave it as old honey and when new nectar is coming in, that's what they use, that's what they build and that's what they consume. So older honey is worth taking off, but it's not a good idea to leave several boxes of capped honey on your hive, hoping the bees will use that through winter because the winter temperatures, remember their stimulus to develop brood comes from environmental cues. So when the environment is not providing what they need for reproduction, the number of bees inside that hive will dwindle. So when that happens, they don't have enough bees to utilize the entire interior space. And that's why Dr. Seeley came out with this whole plan of using smaller boxes going into winter. And for me, that's been a recipe for success, even with uninsulated beehives going into winter and having small spaces that they can manage. Larger spaces, it collects cold, it also can provide insulation down around the bees. The honey becomes a heat bank or a cold bank, whichever. But if it's cold up there and there's warm air coming off of your bee cluster and they haven't migrated up there to use it yet, condensation forms on your honey inside the hive and runs down on your bees and makes it not manageable for them. So when we have, and this is not an alarm for what's going on with you right now because we're in summertime, but I'm telling people so they plan ahead to please scale down their hives to match the population in it and not think that keeping a lot of boxes on the hive is going to help your bees in the long run. So right now with the warm temps and everything, you've got temps 75 to 77 during the day, your bees are managing that just fine. Plus they're also going to expand into that and use that uh, flow super. And the flow super comes off for winter. So there you go. And for people that submit questions like that about internal climate issues and things, I'd like to know how many entrances do you have? Is your hive vented and things like that? So these are other things that might contribute to why there would be condensation up there. But I see it in the observation hives until they get populated. There is some condensation up above. And as the population builds, it ceases to exist at all. And early in the morning, we see the condensation, a ring of condensation at the bottom near the entrance only. Question number eight, Ross from Pittman, New Jersey. On the theme of treating with oxalic acid, oxalic acid from beekeeping websites, brand name, Apobioxyl, runs $50 a pound compared to genetic OA at 13 cents a pound on Amazon and is 99.6% pure. Is there a difference? Are beekeeping websites taking advantage of us. Okay, it's a great question. That was my cover thumbnail for today. So when we mention Apobioxyl, this is what 
we're talking about. Notice that this is labeled as a miticide for treatment for honeybees. And this particular packet is 175 grams. So what's it gonna cost you to use this packet to treat your hives? If it's $27, which yeah, that's expensive for 175 grams, that's 31 cents a dose if you're giving two gram doses. The dosage and approved methods of delivery for that is also on the label. So we know that here in the United States, we were latecomers to getting oxalic acid approved as a treatment, as a miticide for varroa destructor mites in beehives. And then later we got it approved, not just for use against varroa mites, but it was approved for use with honey supers on. And there's another level to that. That's federal. So state by state, they can put tighter restrictions on the use of oxalic acid, period. So in some states, we can't even use oxalic acid at all with honey supers on, even though it's federally approved. So each state has their own rules, but I'm right here with Ross originally. This is what I bought when it got approved as a treatment. And this is 99.6% pure oxalic acid. And I thought 99.6, that's fantastic until I found another one. 99.8% pure oxalic acid. And you can see like, see that? It's like not very full. Somebody obviously used it. So, but here's the thing. This is what I have to tell you. It's like when I was in the Navy, guys would ask me stuff. They could ask lots of questions while I was on active duty. And I used to say, if you're asking me the question, this is the answer I have to give you. It has to be labeled as a miticide. It has to be approved for use in your beehive. It has to be a method that's described on the back, a method of delivery that is also approved. So, because I'm an educator on uh, YouTube, you may know that already because you're watching me on YouTube, but uh, I have to give, you know, I have to be responsible about the information that I put out. And that includes telling you that you have to follow, you know, I know beekeepers, some beekeepers, they're, they're living out where they live. They're doing what they want to do and they don't want anybody telling them how to do the things that they do with their bees. I understand. But if you're a new beekeeper and you wanna know strictly, if you really wanna to be totally on the up and up, above board, another nautical term there, nobody's hiding below decks waiting to ambush you. Everything's above board, everything's visible. We have to let people know that those are the rules. And uh, there's another take on that while I'm thinking about it, apoboxyl. The companies that did the research, why do we have approval to use oxalic acid vaporization or oxalic acid dribble? Um, why do we have the approval to begin with? Because companies got together, did the testing, submitted the permit requests, and got it approved. And that's where these companies are, the reward or the payback for them should be or would be that people would buy the apivoxyl from those who got it approved for us to use here in the United States. So that's where that comes from. Now, is it different? It's the interesting part of this is, this is 97% oxalic acid dihydrate and inert ingredients of 3%. Part of this is where these come from and the origin of the lab is right here. So these come from Vito Pharma and that's in France. So this is actually imported. It's not even produced here in the United States. But they have to be 100% accountable for everything that's in this packet because it's being sold as a miticide, a treatment that's going to go into beehives that's going to produce food-based products for people to consume. So there are wickets they have to get through even in the labs where this stuff is produced. But then we look at this this is really wood bleach, 
And what responsibility do they have, if any, to guarantee the composition of this? Because frankly, it's wood bleach. They don't have to be concerned about any secondary impact or other materials that might be in this because 99.6, there's 0.4% and something else we don't know about, but they don't have to meet the same level when it's not being sold as a treatment inside honeybee hives that a treatment that is being used inside honeybee hives has to. So this one's uh, Eisen Golden Laboratories and uh, Again, it's just, uh, it's wood bleach. So, not telling you what to do, but if someone's asking me the question, that's the answer I have to give. So, but anyway, it's affordable. I mean, 20, you know, 31 cents per dose. I can pay that. You can, you can pay that. Question number nine, Ron Becker comes from uh, Greenback, Tennessee. On several Q&A sessions, you talk about caging the queen in a frame to create a brood break, then releasing the queen and freeze the frame of brood or feeding it to your chickens. My question is, if you did two or three hives at the same time, could you take those two or three frames with the nurse bees and create a split, maybe use temp queen strip, then after the brood emerges, Treat with oxalic acid, thus killing the mice, but also saving the brood. Now, I hadn't thought about doing that, but I see no reason why you couldn't. In fact, the fact that you're pulling, those are, those are a loss anyway. So if you're pulling these frames, once the queen's been caged and she's restored to the colony, and you've got your brood break so you can do an OAV treatment, and you pull that frame out, if you put that in a hive by itself away, with several other frames that are undergoing the exact same thing. And why wouldn't you do those breaks all at the same time? Because the dearth period is happening. You want to do it at a time when they're facing a dearth anyway. And then uh, you've got those other frames there. You could do a treatment that you could use on those frames that wouldn't be approved with honey supers on, for example. So I see no reason why you couldn't do that. And if you do do it, let us know how it works, Ron. That sounds like a good plan because people don't want to toss them out but one of the reasons that that brood break works is uh, because uh, people want to do a single treatment. They don't, don't want to buy the more expensive treatments and things like that. But you could certainly do it and try it. And tell us what kind of mite counts you get too. And see how it goes. Question number 10 is from uh, Victor. I'm a backyard beekeeper. I like your site and the videos and suggestions that you have about beekeeping. It's extremely useful. Thanks for watching. And thanks for those of you who are out there watching. And don't forget, there's a lot of these. So you might want to click the thumbs up button so that you know that you've watched this episode. Now moving on. One of the things that's recently caught my attention is the proliferation of beehive monitors. It seems that most measure weight, temperature, humidity. One measures ingress and egress and another measures vocalization. I'm hoping that you will soon look at these and evaluate what is available and what is most valuable. Okay, every beekeeper has their individual likes, dislikes, and practices. And I realize that part of what I do is I take things that have benefits to bee yards, to hives, and things like that. I try them out. Sometimes, and I know some people will not like what I'm about to say, when I find something that doesn't work, that is really bad, I just don't make a video about it. And people will say, but if you don't make a video, how are we supposed to know that's garbage if you don't make a video about it? Well, cause um, I'm gonna tell you what works when it works. And uh, if it's marginal, I'll tell you that it's marginal, but if it's an utter failure, I don't uh, report about it anymore. So, here's what, so I'm telling you what I find personally valuable. And uh, that is, you have to wonder, what are you going to do with the information you have about what's going on in your beehive? And at what time of year you're hoping to get this information? And how much extra work and material does that put into your hive? And uh, this reminds me too, there was an article in the American Bee Journal, I believe, or it could be Bee Culture, I forget, it's one of the two. Uh, they talked about bees' response to electronic devices inside the beehive. And it wasn't favorable. Ross Conrad wrote the article. 
and Ross Conrad's in Vermont. And a you know, disclaimer there, he's kind of a holistic beekeeper. But he had very interesting things to say about the honeybee's reaction and how it disrupts even part of the microbiome of the bee being in close proximity to electronic devices. So we have to weigh, and I'm not saying that you know, he was right or wrong. I'm just saying there's food for thought here. And I also like to say that there are opportunities to fail safe. And by that, I mean that let's say that uh, there isn't anything wrong with any of the electronic devices that we put in there that provide us with this information. Uh, we don't fail by not using it. And let's say there is something wrong <laughs> with some of those things that we're putting in there because we just have to know. We have to know the information. Well, then uh, if there is something wrong with it, and then we've damaged our bees to some level just so we can have information. So then in the, the, the end of that is, what do we do with the knowledge we gain from that? So for example, uh, the acoustic uh, trackers that some people have, there are, there are smart hives in production that gauge the acoustic, the noise level of the hives because it lets us know when they're making preparations to swarm. There are some that record queen quacking and tooting and piping. And so all these things that alert the beekeeper. My opinion is that if you're present in your backyard beehive area and you're looking at landing boards and you're in touch with your bees and you're making comparisons between the different hives and you're seeing that things seem normal or not, I think that uh, your experience will give you all of the information that you really need. Now I jumped on board and I bought a whole box of brood minders, the insert kind that read out the temperatures. You can check it on your phone because you need to know. And then you get these real cool drafts that graphs, I'm sorry, that show the, the rise and fall of temperature and humidity through the year and through winter. And then you think, wow, that's cool. Look what, look what I have. And like people go to a bee meeting and they show the graphs and look at the humidity and look at the temperature and look at the rise and fall. And then my question is always, okay, what do you do with that information? Well, this hive's dead because there's no, uh, the temperature is basically matching the outside temperature, so it's a dead hive. Okay, so what do you do with the information? Do you go out there in January and break down the hive and are you gonna install new bees? What's your plan? So there's nothing really to do other than forecast what your losses might be. And so, uh, you know, I know I'm, I'm saying a lot of stuff here, but if all I want to know is if my bees are alive or dead, um, there are very inexpensive sensors that I tested to do that. And I bought like four different companies' sensors, temperature and humidity, and they're cheap. And there's a readout, so they don't go to my phone. By the way, I hate, I don't have my phone on me. I don't carry it with me. I hate my cell phone. It's a time suck. It uses up all of my attention when I don't want it to. So it sits parked on a dock, charging, whatever. It's a tool. Um, so I don't want a bunch of beehive information coming to my phone and giving me alerts that, you know, their humidity is too high. And, you know, when it's 10 degrees outside, you know, the 1st of February. So we have to think about, is the investment going to be worth it? Because one of the first things that came out uh, was the ability to weigh your hives and know when they're gaining weight, when they're losing weight. Well, you can walk into your bee yard and smell the, you know, smell the air and know that they're working nectar heavy. You can push on a beehive and feel how heavy it is. So this particular hive is doing well or it's not. This hive over here is loaded. It's like trying to push a brick. And so there are things that we can learn just by looking at the hives, touching the hives, interacting with the hives without adding a pile of electronics to it and a whole bunch of sensors. Now for scientific research, where you need the data and you need data crunching and Penn State, they have a whole bunch of broodminder equipment. And because they're doing studies, they're publishing papers, they have to back up their claims with hard data so the scientific method requires hard data. Uh, but the backyard beekeeper who just wants to know how my bees are doing right now can listen, get a stethoscope and listen to the side of it. Uh, this year I bought uh, baby cups and I put microphones in them and then I stuck them on the side of the hive because I wanted to be able to hear better what's going in, on in there instead of putting my head up against it 
or having a stethoscope in my ears, you know. So there are a lot of things that we can do that give us information that we want. But then again, if you had the information, what would you do? That's all I'm saying. So I don't actually have, uh, I mean, there are whole smart um, apiaries that are in these big steel containers. So they're, they're headed that way um, with advanced technology that these things operate themselves, even detecting mites, even treating mites as necessary. That's gone way off the rails. That's why I'm a backyard beekeeper. I'm not a commercial beekeeper. So, and nothing against commercial beekeeping, but data like this would do nothing for me. Because it's just like that. You find out a hive's dead in winter, it's dead. It's like people that have to open their hive to look to see. I need to know if they're dead. Well, if they're dead, you can't do anything until spring anyway. And if they're alive and you pull that lid off, you just nail their brood. So you just really challenge them. So I opened no hives during the winter time. Uh, but these sensors, and I'll put the video uh, link here of the sensors that are reviewed because they're dirt cheap. A lot of these other sensors and systems that are designed for beehives are uh, not, not cheap. But you can put these up on top of your inner cover. And I know that's not going to read the temperatures and the humidity in the brood box itself. But you will see enough of a change of temperature and humidity that you'll know that your bees are alive or dead. If you just have to know, if you're just preoccupied and you just have to know. That's what that's good for. But uh, hive monitors don't do anything for me. So now I don't have any. I have a whole box of brood minders if anybody wants to buy some cheap. So you can have those. So I don't need them. All right, next question, number 11. This comes from James, Horton, Michigan. I have a question concerning, concerning swarms. At this time in the season, I really don't want any swarms. And I've been trying to keep on top of monitoring. My question is this. If I capture a swarm in one of the traps and immediately remove the queen, will the swarm return to their original hive once they realize there is no queen? This would keep the population up and they would have a new queen when they return. I ask this because you mentioned that when you relocate the swarm, Bees left behind will return to their original hive. Yes. Okay, so here's the thing. My easiest answer for this is to show you a video. Um, I made a video about that very thing on July 14th of 2013. Because back then I was studying swarms. I was videoing them from all angles. I was looking to see their waggle dances on the surface. I was trying to find out how many queens were in the swarm. And in this video that I'll give you the link to so you can find it and go watch it. Um, I see the queen come out. I collected the queen. There were two queens in that swarm, I believe. And when I collected them, uh, within minutes, even less than minutes, the bees realized something was missing. Something was gone. Remember earlier today I said if the bees are bivouac somewhere and they're settled and they're clustered, there is a queen in there somewhere or they wouldn't be in that situation. So in the absence of the queen, when we pull her out of there, now they start looking around and then they get all excited and they're kind of frenzied because they've lost their queen and they would like to move to wherever she is. And I took the two queens and I put them in separate boxes well away. And pretty soon when they couldn't find her anymore, where did they go? They all went back to the hive that they departed from. So yeah, you can save all of uh, all or most of your workers that way. And it absolutely works. And I demonstrated that in that video. So the challenge is to find the queen, to have the patience and attention to detail. What happens too is when there's a cluster and the bees are bivouacked like that, they'll periodically you'll see a little kind of vent hole open up and that tends to lead to where the queen is. And I realized that she could come out on any side of this cluster and then go back in. They have a habit of when they're clustered up against a building or something, the queen likes to move under all the other workers. So even when they cluster over an opening that they're going to occupy, the queen moves underneath of them and into that opening. So you have your work cut out for you to locate the queen, but you can do it. And if you get her and you cage her and you take her away and you put her in some small nucleus hive or something like that as insurance, if you'd like to, because keep in mind, the queens that are about to emerge from their cells in the colony they left, when they all go back there, if they don't emerge successfully and if they don't fly out successfully, get mated, come back and start laying, 
that queen that you took out of there before is going to be the future of that colony again because now you can bring her back and reinstall her when they find themselves broodless and queenless. So, it's a lot of fun to do. Did that video in 2013. That is it for today, so here's the fluff. Thank you, by the way, for those of you who watched my video that I posted yesterday, which was about uh, landing board inspections, behaviors on the landing board, and uh, deck washing, washboarding, whatever you want to call it. And then, of course, the bees um, showing us whether they accepted the size of their entrance or if they wanted it smaller, how they indicated that with propolis by trying to seal it up even more, or those that wanted more space by chewing away at the wood and the entry uh, trying to get a larger space. So I pulled that piece of wood off. They've got more room now. And those that wanted it smaller, they have their wish. It's just the way it is. I left it like that and so on. But if you haven't seen that, that's an interesting close-up look at what the bees are doing on the landing boards. And uh, I'd like to remind people, this is a great time of year to be doing your mite counts. If you're one of the people that treats for mites, you want to know your levels, you want to make sure that they're under control, great time of year to do that and get the bees off of your uh, brood frames when you're counting because some people are counting on dead bees to count the mites. Now, when a bee dies, the mites, if they have a live bee to go to, they're clamoring onto that live bee, so you would have almost none on your dead bees at the bottom. It doesn't hurt to practice doing mite washes on dead bees, but don't count on that being a really good indicator that you've got mites or not in that hive. Always get the nurse bees. Sugar shake, safest method. Okay, so anyway, and uh, do, try to do inspections every three weeks or less. And what else? Today's shout out is going to go to, and this is for people that uh, are in hot climates, direct sunlight. Uh, this year they're not getting much rain and their bees are not under any kind of shelter. So, my wife has been after me about a lean-to. I don't like that idea. Jeff Horshaw, Mr. Ed, he likes lean-tos down in the south, and he says that they, the bees under lean-tos, under shelters, do extremely well. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is something in between those two things. It's not a full structural lean-to, but they're not fully in the open, and this will help. Patio sunshades. Okay. So the website I'm going to send you to is Brighton's Reviews and More. I'm going to put the link down in the video description. But he did a review of Patio Sunshades. And uh, it's really interesting because those can be attached to a building. Those can be, you can, you can have posts that are extensions of fence posts and things like that. And they allow some sun to pass through. The most important part for me is that air moves freely through them but they provide partial shade for your hives and therefore cool them down. But don't, you know, if you just had like a tarp or something that water doesn't pass through and air doesn't pass through, that could actually have the, a negative effect. But these shades, these sun shades, um, are like a fine screen that can actually be rigged and then they just give you shade and air passes through them. So that's going to be my shout out for today. That's a small channel. I wish we would give him some support there, maybe. I don't know him, but I just, I like sunshades, and I think that that would be something, a good compromise between a full-on lean-to and, of course, uh, having nothing and just having them exposed to the sun. I'm not going to put it over mine, but I'm not in the desert southwest or somewhere where things are baking right now. Parts of California, too. So rather cool them with shade than adding extra venting because venting creates another challenge for them. It dehydrates the brood. So that's my shout out for today. I want to thank you for spending your time with me on this Friday. And I hope that you have a fantastic weekend ahead and that your bees are doing great. And if you have questions, go ahead and write them in the comment section below this video or follow the link in the video description to the form on my main website, which is the way to be. Org. Thanks for being here. Have a great weekend.